So um, we, you've all seen him on the screen, and um, he is a part-time resident here in Santa Maria, and um, and also out of county. Um, he is a professional photographer and uh, a wide variety of photos from um, events to landscape, commercial, um, portraiture, advertising. So um, I, I think he's a really all-around um, excellent person for, uh, for judging for us because we have no theme, especially this month. Um, he is also an ultra runner and a race director probably in town today because there's a race on uh, an event on Saturday. And um, so uh, unfortunately I'm not able to do it, but um, uh, I, I wish I have friends that are, and I wish uh, every you well with that event, Louise. So um, with that, I think we'll, um, oh, one last thing. So, you know, he was selected best photographer of the year by the readers of the Santa Maria Sun from 2009 to 2014. Wow. 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 All you have to do is buy advertising and then you're the best. <laughs> well, Luis, I wanted you to know you, you may be, be an ultimate runner, but I'm an ultimate passenger. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, guys, I'm I'm happy to be here. I've been um invited to uh to come to the Santa Maria Camera Club many times over the years. I've served as a judge uh, quite a few times and I'm just I'm always happy to, to spend some time with you and I'm really excited and proud of all of you for keeping it going uh, finding a way being creative and finding a way to stay in touch and to continue to communicate and teach and educate each other um, through this format hopefully eventually you all be able to get back together in person again but until then I think you're doing a great job uh, I've been in Santa Maria since about 1984 or 85. I came here from Atascadero to go to Hancock College to study photography. I started working at a little photography studio out on the corner of Clark and Bradley. It's called Reflections Photography Studio, and um, I'm still here. Um, the business has gone through a lot of changes. Um, I owned the house on South Broadway uh, across the street from the Santa Maria Inn for about 13 years. A portrait studio called Images, and um, I think I'm the last standing studio portrait photographer. I used to be the young kid, and now I'm one of the old guys, and everybody else has died or left. So it's a really interesting time for me and for, for photography. My business has really changed. People rarely come into the studio anymore. Um, I rarely, rarely do residential photography like seniors or children or weddings or family portraits. I do some of that, but mostly what I do is commercial photography or work for businesses all over the state and, and beyond. And so, yeah, I have a wide variety of uh, experience. I'm not particularly good at any one thing, but uh, pretty handy with the camera. I've been paying my bills with the, with the camera since uh, right out of high school. And I, I got to tell you this, I looked through your photographs and I'm really no one to be judging your work. It's beautiful. All of it. Every one of these images that I've seen um, in this collection are just fantastic. And so putting numbers onto it, it's really a challenging thing. And I'll do my best to to follow these uh, the rules here and um, try to give you guys some nice scores. Great. Thank you. Are we ready to start with the competition? <clears throat> All right, we have 13 color images. We'll step through them first, and then we'll go back and listen to your comments. Before you do that, can I ask a couple of things? Sure. You you sent me two galleries of color photos. Are all of these being judged in one continuous judging, or are these two different categories? No, they, I just broke them up so that the email program wouldn't complain about the size. Got it. And then I understand that that the scoring system, I just want to review it before we get down the road here, that you, you have three different qualities or characteristics that you want me to focus on. And in order of importance, I guess, it's technicality, composition, interest, and impact. Is that yes. correct? That's okay. correct. And you'd like me to score these photographs one through seven for each one of those 
Correct. Yeah, yeah but, but you really you are only score. interested in a collective score. I understand that. And okay. I just want to say, if these are listed in your order of importance, technicality, composition, no. interest, and impact, um, I would turn that upside down. Me personally, if I'm creating a photograph, the most important thing to me is impact and sellability. If someone's going to look at this, want to continue to look at it, and then want to pay me for it. So the impact, in my mind, is absolutely the most important element in creating and presenting a photograph. The second thing uh, yeah, is light, light and I've composition. Never been, I've never been aware of any any uh, um, hierarchy of the three. They're just they're, those are the three conditions, the three characteristics that uh, they're to be judged by. I don't think there's ever been. I'm not aware of any hierarchy. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. the, there is no order. Okay. Well, it, it just, but, just so you know, in my mind, when I look at things, that's how I see it. I, it impact is the first and most important thing. Second thing would be light and composition. Those things go together. And then, the technical, then the technical quality of the image. And then the fourth thing would be presentation. But that would be for like a live photograph. So anyway, that's what's in my mind. I think I understand the judging system, so I'm ready. I'll stop talking. Okay. We'll start. We'll do our run through on the colors, 13 images. Okay, this is our first image. This is Arch on Fire. I'm going to turn the lights down in the room I'm in. Hold on just a moment. The light switch is in Santa Barbara. I'm here. <laughs> I think this is a beautiful photograph, and it's a great idea and a beautiful use of that space. I'd like to give this image a score of 15. I'm not sure if that's high or low. I'm not sure what kind of scores you guys are used to, but I think that's a pretty high score. Um, and all I can say is it's a beautiful photograph, and I really commend the maker for having this uh, concept in their mind and using this this room, this rock room, to reflect that light and project it out. It's really beautiful. Um, the idea of slowing the shutter way down like that to capture that movement and also the glow coming out of that room, and then also even the stars in the background. It's just beautiful, very, very well done. I'd be proud if this was my image for sure. So I'll give it a 15 and say, nice, beautiful. Bath time. When I saw this at, originally and I was scrolling through the images, I, this one really caught my eye and I stopped and looked at it for a while. To take an amazing amount of patience and just absolute perfect timing. Not only is it composed well, exposed beautifully, it's very, very much in focus. And I just don't know how you were able to do this. Um, I think this is a great image to be able to stop the motion like that and on such a small subject that I know is moving very, very quickly. 
And not only that, it looks like the aperture was very wide, uh, wide enough to create that background. And this is just a great photo all, all the way around. And a catch light in the eye, which is really an amazing thing to be able to pull all of that off all in one time. Um, I'd like to score this image as a 16. Rockley Field Sunrise. I've been doing a lot of work in the farm fields in the last few years, and so I know what it's like to be out there. And um, this, again, is another beautiful photograph. And I just want to point out a lot of the obvious things that make this thing great and commend the photographer for a few things. Um, one is obeying the, the rule of thirds and placing that horizon line in that top third. That's great. Um, oftentimes, it's dead center, which sometimes dead center works beautifully. But in this situation, I think he made the right choice. The other thing that I like about this image is the the leading lines are not dead straight. It's not from the front to the back. Those diagonals, I think, are what makes this interesting. Most of us see this scene as we drive by on the freeway or wherever we happen to be, and we see it, we see the roads going directly off into the horizon. So this is, I think, just a different perspective. It's great. The other thing that makes this image strong in my mind is the composition with the trees on the horizon line and this balance a large mass on the right a smaller mass towards the left and it balances it out i just think it's great i would like to score this image of 14 one four kingston Any time I have the opportunity to shoot against the grain of the light, I do it. And that's what this photographer did as well. So this ambient light coming from above and behind the subject, flowing towards the camera lens, is what created that texture. And it looks to be actually a very small light source. The shadows are sharp on the face, but at the same time, it's very soft and you can feel that texture uh, in that fabric and that all has to do with direction of light so whoever made this photograph is is seeing light and seeing the direction of light and the quality of light and using it i think in the correct way beautiful photograph beautiful portrait i'm sure that the parents of this little person would love to have this picture in their home i'll score this one a, a 14 also one four Milky Way over Boot Arch. I've seen so many of these images recently. It seems like it's very popular to do this type of long exposures. I've never done one, so I'm really not anyone to be judging this. I will say that the, again, just like the farm field, the composition with the horizon line is beautifully done. When I've seen these images that are really successful, the photographer uses another source of light to illuminate the foreground in some interesting way. So again, I've never even made an image like this, so who in the heck am I to tell you what to do? But maybe you could put a small flash off camera to the left or to the right and just rake some light across the texture in the foreground just a little bit. Um, I can see that there's detail in the rock in the foreground, but it might be even more impactful if there was some interesting pattern of light across the bottom there as well. Um, I just, again, this is another fantastic photograph and uh, congratulations, it's beautiful. I will give this image a 
13, 1-3. How am I doing? Is this what you guys want to hear? Am I doing it right? Yes. yes. Perfect. This is titled Pastoral. Sometimes when you're in this situation, it's hard to get the white to be white. A lot of times the camera wants to make that kind of gray. And so I think that the exposure was done correctly and the work after the fact was also done beautifully. I can see that there's some effect here, but it's not overwhelming. Another thing I'd like to say is anytime I have the opportunity to photograph from dark to light, I do that. And what I mean by that is the foreground in the bottom is dark, darker. And then the mid and the background is lighter. And it creates a sense of three dimension. If that bottom quarter of the image was not included, I don't think this photograph would be as strong. It's strong because it has depth and texture. I also like the idea of of having the the courage to turn the camera sideways. Um, you know, I'm from this world of square photography. I grew up, I was taught to photograph with a square image and I would have to compose a vertical or a horizontal in my mind as I'm looking through the viewfinder. And now for the last how many years, everything you know is horizontally in my hand. And most of the time my customers want a horizontal image. Um, it's very rare that I turn the camera over. And so I think this is a great use of a vertical uh, composition. I'll give this a 14 also, one four. Waterfall to lower emerald pool. So this image also stopped me as I was scrolling through. Um, I think it's strong and for quite a few reasons. Again, what I just said about going from dark to light, that's happening here. So the bottom third of the photograph, um, darker tones, and the light again is coming towards the camera. So it is against the grain of the light, which I like to do. Again, that creates texture and depth. And the waterfall being composed against that dark wall and then light coming through the water is what is creating the strength and the impact in this thing. The other thing that you have going on here is the contrast um, in colors, warm and the cool tones together. And so that's something anytime you have an opportunity to photograph aspen trees or cottonwoods, uh, especially, you know, in this part of the the country, um, put them up against a blue sky, a dark blue sky, and it's just going to pop just like this is doing here. I think this is a beautiful photograph. And again, commend the photographer for turning that camera onto its side and making this beautiful vertical composition. I'll give this photograph a 15, one five. Egrets in my dream. This image also stopped me in my tracks as I was flipping through the photographs. And it's a beautifully done photograph and the effects are, I think are well done. It looks like a water painting or oil painting. And I know that it's a fantasy and the title is even a dream. But oftentimes, if I look at an image and the first thing I see is the filter or the effect, uh, I think it. I'm looking at that and I'm not looking at the photography. Maybe I just because I'm old. Um, it's a beautiful photograph. It's a great story. But for my taste, for my likings, for my customers' likings, I think it's 
overdone with the filtration and the saturation. Um, I'm sure that there's a market for it somewhere. It's a beautiful photograph, but um, I don't know. I think it, a less effect and uh, and that's it. I would give this photograph a 13, one three. Escalante Slot Canyon. It's amazing that you guys get to go to all of these places and do this stuff. I rarely, you know, in all of these years with this camera in my hand, I rarely shoot for myself. I rarely go to places and do things like this. And pretty much everything I do is. Uh, to fulfill an order. So it's really exciting for me to see these kind of images. The obvious things are the leading lines from the front to the back and taking you into this canyon. It's just everything that you ask for um, in, in terms of creating a photograph, this thing has it, right? The direction of light, the color, the texture, the leading lines, the composition, um, all of it. It's just a fantastic image. And I also like the idea that you vignetted the corners as strongly as you did. And that just kind of pulls your attention into the back of this canyon. It's a great photograph. Um, I'll give it a 15, one five. Peekaboo. It's a great photo, and I like the square composition. I kind of like to get back to that world of photographing in squares. As a portrait photographer, I, if I was going to critique this, um, it's just the typically a, a rule in portrait photography is that the brightest part of the image should be the mask of the face. That's the triangle, the inverted triangle, the eyebrows down to the lips. And that's not happening here. I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm just telling you the rule that I was taught. And that's a lot of forearm. And I think a strict portrait photographer judge would um, would knock it down quite a bit because that's a lot of forearm there. So there, maybe there's a way to um, to hide that, um, tone it down in post processing, or put something in front there. It's a great, beautiful, fun, awesome picture. And I'm sure that her parents would love to have this. I'm going to give it a 13-1-3. Standing tall. This is another one when I was flipping through that I stopped and looked at for quite a while. It's just the, the simplicity of it is the, is the, the selling point of it. Vertical lines in a horizontal composition. I think that's hard to pull that off, and you've done it beautifully. The framing, perfect. It does seem a little flat, and I don't know if that has to do with my screen or the way I'm looking at it, but it seems like it could be a little snappier. Um, I'm not even sure if that's a photography term or not, but maybe a little more contrasty, it looks a little flat. Um, other than that, it's a beautiful photograph and I'd love to have this in my house, big on a wall. I actually have a couple of you, your photographs in my house from, from this camera club. Um, I'd like to have this one too. This is a beautiful photograph. I'd like to also give this one a 15, one five. I guess we'll look at that again later. On. River below Narrows.
Well, just like the farm field and that slot canyon, do you do a great job of using those diagonal lines to to draw the view from the front of the image into into the back into the canyon. What I would say if if there was a way, and you know, I don't know, but if there was something in the immediate foreground, the bottom third, again, if I could shoot from dark to light to create even more depth. And you have that going here, but it could be, I think, somehow even stronger if there was an element in the foreground um, to create a foreground, middle, and a background. The landscape photography that I've watched myself about and watching videos and studying photographs, there's oftentimes a very strong element in the foreground, and that's not not happening here. Um, again, the contrast of the warm and the cool tones, the warmth of the rock, and obviously the leaves, and then the blue sky, it all works perfectly. And placing the horizon line on the bottom third is again another another rule that you're obviously understanding and practicing. I'll give this image a 14, one four. Steamboat so, rock, sorry. I'm sorry, I, I need to let you finish. So, so, so here we go. So that last image, there was nothing in the foreground, right? It was just the trail on the left and then the creek or the river. Here, there's something, there's a strong element in the foreground and it's dark and it leads to light. So this is kind of what I was referring to, right? So having something in the foreground to create depth. Again, like who in the heck am I to be judging your stuff? But the, the one thing that jumps out to me is that Unlike the the trees, the vertical lines and the horizontal format that seem a little flat, this seems extremely contrasty. And 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 due to some manipulation in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever it was, it looks very crispy, maybe a little bit too crispy for my personal likings. If I was had this image on one of my computers, I would dial it back a couple of notches and not quite so contrasty. The edges of the elements are extremely sharp. And I'm not sure if that's what you were going for. The beautiful, beautiful use of the, of the clouds in the sky. Give this image a 13, one, three. Okay, we need to break a tie. Um, we're gonna pick second, uh, third in honorable mention from the group that I list. We're gonna have uh, number one, Arch on Fire. Number seven, Waterfall to Lower Emerald Pool. Escalante Slot Canyon, number nine. 11, Standing Tall, and that's it. So out of those four images, we need you to want... Pick, yeah, a second, third, and honorable mention. Oh, so we're going to eliminate one. Yeah. Yes. I don't like that. <laughs> My pen just ran out of ink. Okay. So I would say the honorable mention, I really like that arch photograph and that technique. And I 
don't want to eliminate that photograph. So can we make that the honorable mention? And then number three, I really, again, who in the heck am I to be picking stuff, you guys? But the standing tall is just a striking image to me. And I think it's just beautifully done to take something that's so simple and really common to, to make something extraordinary out of something that's ordinary. It's just beautifully done. So if we can make that number three and the slot Canyon is just fantastic. And I'd like to select that one as number two. Okay, we are ready. Are you guys gonna come over here and cut the tires on my truck? <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody out there. No, no, no. Okay, this is Arch on Fire by Penny Powell and Honorable Mention. Penny, is this the Joshua Tree? Um, that was at um, the Alabama Hills. Penny in the background. Yeah, yeah. I can see through, and I Whitney in the background. Uh, I spent a lot of time there in Mount Whitney. I've been to the top of that many times. It's just a beautiful place. Yeah, great. You see what? Can't make out anything. This is bath time, and our first place image by Jeannie Sparks. All right, Jeannie. Wait a minute, Jeannie, the Jeannie Sparks is here on this Hey, call. how are you, Lewis? What the heck? Holy smokes. I didn't know that it was going to be like famous people here. baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. It's been a good long to see time. You too. Many years. Yeah, that's right. Broccoli Field Sunrise by Cheryl Decker. Kingston. By Gregory Dowsna. Milky Way Over Boot Arch by Elaine Calvert. Pastoral, Tony Martindale. Beautiful. Tony, is the new private? Waterfall to Lower Emerald Pool by Larry Decker. Yes, he's in for right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, Tony. Thanks. I like this one, too. <laughs> Tony, you love this picture, don't you? Secrets in My Dream by Jenny Sparks. Escalante, Slot Canyon, and second place by Cheryl Decker. All right, Cheryl. Wow. Cheryl. Peekaboo by Tony Martindale. Yep. Standing Tall and Third Place by Elaine Calvert. Very good. Um, Virgin <laughs> River Below Narrows by Larry Decker. And Steamboat Rock by Ed Hall. <laughs> Elaine, can I uh, can I ask a question about that standing tall photograph? Yes, of course. Um, what was the what led to that? Where were you? How did that come about? Is it a place that you had been studying, or are you just wandering around and found it, or how did I've it I've been there several times, and I photographed that area more than once. Um, it's in the Eastern Sierras, and um, it, I agree, it looks very flat. I almost wanted to pull it out of the competition. Both of my images. I'm struggling um, to get them uh, import or sent over by email and having the colors come out the way I'm seeing them on my computer. I do have my computer um, calibrated and I just haven't been able to figure out what's going on. But, but thank you, I, I'm surprised I did so well. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just because your computer's calibrated, all not all screens are calibrated to one another, so it's well, it's hard, you know. Yeah, it's there's inconsistency. 
there's a little box that I've learned I need to check to make it PC friendly and it has a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I thought I had it figured out, I thought that was why I was using the black. Um, I don't know. I have to work on that. Elaine, what color space are you using when you send those files? I, I process everything in Pro Photo, but when I send it, I send it in sRGB. Okay, because that can make a difference. Too. Yeah, I'm I know. I it's sRGB. That's yeah, I make sure. Most consistent results that way, but. Yeah, I. I. <laughs> but when we look at them, we switch it back and forth between the two computers, and they look fine. Yeah, when and as soon as we mail them. When you apply sRGB, are you converting it or assigning the profile? What's the difference on that? Well, there is there is a difference. Photoshop there is a difference. Is, I, I don't know about Lightroom, but Photoshop gives you a difference. You can convert to profile or assign to profile. You want to convert to profile. Usually convert. Well, so if you're doing it in right. Photoshop, yeah. make sure that you're converting, not assigning. And um, Elaine, make sure that you flatten the file before you uh, convert it and create the, the, yeah, the uh, JPEG. That, that's important. Flatten it. Yeah, I usually do. Yeah, well, you should do it all the time because it's really important. You will there will be times when the image won't look anything way that you would. I'm I'm the dummy who flattens everything. I never save my layers. I flatten everything. <laughs> so I just flatten, I flatten anything in in Lightroom. No, I flatten it in um, Photoshop. Yeah, there's no layers in Lightroom. So. No, yeah, no. But anyway, I know you didn't want to spend this much time discussing my image. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I move on to monochrome. Maybe. But before, we, before we stop with you, Elaine, I, I do have one of your images in my house still. Do you remember? Yes, I'm, I'm so proud of that. You can't believe how proud I am. <laughs> I had, I think I bought that photo from you maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago. And yeah. it's, in, it's in my house right now. I look at it every day. Oh, I that's... Love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> that warms my heart. That's what photography is about. It's for connecting with other people and for sharing. And that's the most important thing to me, I think. Pleasing myself, but, you know, <clears throat> helping other people like me, too. <laughs> okay. Oh. We have only five monochrome images. <coughs> oh, yes, I remember that now. What? Okay, it's our first image. And this is titled The Horse Soldiers on Patrol. Well, I don't even have a strong enough vocabulary to tell you how much I like this photograph. Um, some of the things that we talked about in that last gallery, the idea of going from dark to light, I hope I'm describing that correctly. I think I am. So it, it almost looks like the bottom corners are vignetted. And to me, that's a good thing. It draws, it creates depth, it creates texture. The idea also of getting yourself sort of below the subject and, and allowing those vertical lines from what I am sure are mustard plants, allowing that to be there and be part of the experience. Just enough texture in the sky that it's not just a blown out white sky, I think is great. I've also photographed a lot of equestrian stuff. And to include the entire horse is so important to the riders. So not cropping them at their legs or whatever. So showing the entire animal is a great thing. The horizon line at a diagonal is great. I'm sure that you that they were coming downhill 
and you could have straightened that out, but you didn't. And I think that makes great sense. It's not a silhouette, but it's almost a silhouette in the way that it's being hit from behind. Again, shooting against the grain of the light. That's always my preference. And then finally, ultimately, this composition, this, we used to call these a slim gym, big, long, horizontal, panoramic composition, I think is successful here. I really like this photograph. And I would like to give it a 17, one seven. King the, Tide. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this is titled King Tide. So everything that I've been asking for since we started the, uh, a strong subject in the foreground, darker, more low key tones in the foreground, shooting against the grain of the light to create all of that incredible texture, the timing and the focus and the appropriate aperture it all comes into play and this is just another awesome image i don't know that i could make a photograph like this so it's hard for me to be again judging your work so i'm just going on instinct and impact and this is an impactful image it's a strong emotional photograph i would like to also say the idea of um, the basic rule of thirds being followed here beautifully. Just everything about it is great. I'd like to give this image a 16.16. Tour Eiffel. So when I said earlier that if I look at an image and what I see first is technique, the uh, filtration and um, just these added filters, sometimes it doesn't really work for me. In this case, I think it does. I think it's appropriate in this situation. I like that grunge filter or whatever it is that you're using here. I think it's done very beautifully. I like the, the idea of all of that open and negative space, which really draws your eye and attention to the, the big, bold element, the subject of the photograph, the literal subject of the photograph, the tower. Composing the horizon line so low, in this case, I think, was the exact right thing to do including the bottom of the bridge almost all the way across i think was great you're obviously putting a lot of thought into how you're composing this thing through the lens and then after the fact and of course you can't look at this image and then not appreciate that and, and the power of that little tiny element which i think really makes the image super strong, puts it over the top, and that's that little bird flying there. It's a great photograph. I would give this one a 16, one six. March of time. Very Weston-esque and or Paul Strand. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that guy. Um, midday, small light source, very far away light source, creates this intense um, contrast, these very sharp shadows. And uh, I think you did it beautifully. Again, Thanks for turning the camera over.
and giving us this vertical composition. Yeah, I like it. I'll give this image a 15, one five. Woman wrapped in a scarf with wind blowing. It's a hell of a title. So bad. It's easy to be a, a, what is it, a Monday morning quarterback and say, should have do this, should have done that. But I could, if I could make a suggestion or my first thought is maybe just move her in the frame, move the subject in the frame to the left and allow that fabric to flow behind her to exaggerate the concept or the idea of the force of the wind pushing the fabric away from her. That's the only thing that I would do differently is maybe just change the composition slightly. Again, in the world of portrait photography, normally you don't want a dead center. That's just a rule, doesn't always apply. And whether you know it or not, uh, let me tell you something. There's three classic views of the face and one single lighting pattern that goes with all three of those views of the face. And this is called the two thirds view, two eyes, one ear, and then lit off of that right shoulder and the light at about a 45 degree angle. A full face view would be obviously turning the light and the head towards the camera, two ears, two eyes, same lighting pattern. And then the third would be a profile, one eye, one ear, with the exact same lighting pattern, it's just turning the position of the subject or the position of the camera. Anyhow, this is like a perfect example of the two thirds view of the face and the exact right lighting pattern that goes with it. Again, those are just crazy portrait rules that I learned a million years ago. They don't always apply, but I see it happening here and you did it beautifully. I'll give this a 14, one four. Okay, we have, um first, second, and third uh, for this uh, competition with five entries. And we have a tie for second and third between number two and number three. So are you saying I'm going to select one and, and that one will be number two? Right. And then the other one would be third. They're, they're both going to be awarded. <laughs> you don't have I to understand. throw one out. But one would be second and the other one third. Well, they both deserve to be first. They both deserve, you know, high accolades. They're both great images. I'm going to select the seascape as number two and then the landscape, the tower as number three. Yes, sir. That'll do it. Okay, this is um, Horse Soldiers on Patrol, first place by Penny Powell. Good job, Penny. Yeah, that is great. That's absolutely beautiful photo. It is. I agree. King Tide. In second place by Gregory Doudna. Very cool, Greg. Good one, Greg. Dumb luck. <laughs> Whatever works for you. Tour <laughs> <laughs> Eiffel in third place by Jim McInnes. Thank you, Jim. Eiffel. Mm. 
Yes. Uh, March of Time by Ed Powell. Yeah, I like Woman Wrapped in a Scarf with Wind Blowing by Jim McKinnon. Hot diggity. Could you be a little more descriptive next time, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really understand what it was about. I didn't make it number two. <laughs> Luis, the only thing I can say is you've made quite an impression on us that we cannot get rid yeah, of your image. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> He's not winning, guys. That's the main story. Yeah. Well, hey, look at that image. It's everything I was asking for. Right? So, yeah. Twelve. <laughs> great composition. The resolution looks like shit on this screen, but it's a cool photo. <laughs> Made a lot of money with that picture. Did Did you know that guy? Was it staged, or you just caught him? Oh no, I was there photographing models. So oh, that's runners, right. they, they were mod, runners doing what I was asking them to do. And this particular image um, has been in my mind for probably literally 15 years. I would drive by this place and see it and just, I'd never seen a view of the bridge from this perspective. And I, this was a thing that I was just in my head and I just knew before I even got there. <laughs> how it was going to come out and how I was going to do it. And I, I I just knew that I was going to have my 70 to 200 in my hand and I was going to stand on this particular spot and I was going to compose it just like this. We went there. He ran up and down this thing four or five times. I just waited for the right running form to happen. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. And we left. And they're like, that's it. And that's it. That's all we need. And, um, and cool is on the left and Auburn's on the right? That is correct. Okay. Oh. What? I go up there once in a while, and I'm just trying to figure out how I could uh, get down to that spot. And, if there's uh, ever a time, if you guys all want to do a field trip and come up there to gold country, you let me know, and I'll take you around to some really awesome spots. Yeah, that'd be great. All righty. I love the talk around there, the, all the old buildings they haven't modernized. Um, where, where is that again? It's in El, El Dorado Canyon, uh, El Dorado County. In fact, this is on the county line between Placer County and El Dorado County. It, it's the called, confluence of the American River. It, it's called um, it's called Auburn Ravine, I believe. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Auburn Ravine. That is in the Auburn State Recreational Area. Yeah. My new home. I've been there for four years. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't live here anymore? Jeannie, I don't live here full time anymore. I didn't realize that. I'm glad you haven't cut all your ties with us. So. Oh, no. No, I'm still definitely here. I mean, most of my customers are here, and um, I'm, I'm here about half the time. Or maybe a third of the time I'm here. High school. Yeah. So um, I have a, a good friend who has a home here in Santa Maria, and she also has a home in Auburn. So she's back and forth too. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Her name is Lori Maxim. Oh. She works for the school district. Mm. But, uh, wow. So uh, uh, one thing I wanted to say um, that photo of mine of the woman with the wind scarf that that was that's a street photo just in case you hadn't uh known that it's not a studio photo wow that's great and so this was a stranger this is just yes. a person yes oh my gosh that's so cool that you're wow. able to do that kind of stuff and like i said i i i, I rarely go out and do that and just like shoot on my own and just go out and do things that i Think are nice. So I, I really admire you guys for being able to do that. That kind of work has got to be challenging. I'd like to figure out how to sell some things. <laughs> some tour of the fields or even up uh, in uh, your neck of the woods up north. Um, if, why don't you, if, uh, if we're going to communicate, um, 
start through me and I may connect you to Penny Powell who uh, coordinates our events. Field trip. Okay, well, I think that photographing at Gladaway Gardens, the Gladiola farm, they're on Telephone Road. I think that's very realistic. Um, I have done two jobs for them recently and the owner is down in Santa Barbara or Montecito. It's a lady and she is just looking for ways to create awareness about her business and um, they need content. They want photographs that they could use. And I said, you know what you should do is, is like have a photo tour, a photo workshop and just have photographers come and spend the day here and document what they do. And uh, in exchange, they can give you some photographs that you can use on your social media and your marketing. And then they have the opportunity to come and photograph this unique situation. And so I think that they would do it. I just need to, if I told them that I had a group of five or six folks, I, I think that I could make it happen. That would be super. And that would, yeah, I think you'd have more than, than five or it's six. It's right here. It's right here, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful place. Do you think we could pull that off even uh, with COVID? Well, yeah, so that's another thing. Maybe not right at the moment. Um, however, I happen to know that outdoor activities right now are allowed as long as there is six feet physical distance between participants. So like golf, hiking, and trail running is permitted currently if you maintain that distance and are properly covered. That, that but, would be, but but a workshop, I don't know. It might be a little bit too tight right now. Six feet would be four gladiolas, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we, we could each take it. You know, that would be hard. So. Let me talk with the folks. I'm in pretty close contact with them, and um, and I'll see what they say. Yeah, I would think most of those would be out in the fields, right? Are they growing anything? Are well, are they, they're probably growing in greenhouses too, or well, no, not there. They don't grow in greenhouses. They're all outdoors. Okay. Well, that just sounds real doable. Yeah, it does. I think it is. I took I some pictures a of. I took some pictures of the gladiolus last year before they harvested, but just right when I was getting ready to go out and really focus on them, they cut them all down. <laughs> like, <"Why?"> right. <laughs> well, we're just that's, the thing, if we, that's the thing. If we were able to do this, they would specifically, um, you know, not cut them down and leave them up there for you. Sounds good. Wonderful. It would would be um, would there be um, actual people working in the fields as well that we would photograph or just the field? Probably I could probably pull off both of those things that you could photograph um, farm workers. I don't be. know if you guys are following any of the stuff that I've done farm workers, but I do it quite often. You can follow on my Instagram page Lewis underscore Escobar. Um, and photographing farm workers is really exciting. They're beautiful people. Mm -hmm. But if you just wandered out into a field on your own, they will chase you away for sure. A yeah. lot of them don't want to be photographed. So the way to do it is to, you know, go there with the farmer, with the owner of the field. <coughs> and, um, and then, you know, you're there specifically to photograph folks that are working. You can't blame but, to this. I mean... No, many of them don't want to be photographed because many of them um, feel uncomfortable being here, right? So yeah. there's there's that big issue. Well, I've photographed farm workers here in Santa Maria, and um, I haven't had a problem with it. Uh, it just depends, I think, on how you approach uh, doing the, the photography. I, I know they, a lot of them feel uncomfortable, and so if you get that feel at all, then, then you, you don't. Uh, photograph them, but uh, if you talk to them um, and uh, you know, create some kind of uh, 
rapport is not really the right word because you're really not with them very long. But um, it's just your attitude and uh, that type of thing. And, and uh, you know, I haven't photographed a lot of them, but I haven't had any problems with it. I love it. I love photographing the fields. I like watching those folks work and documenting what they do in a in a, in a positive way, you know, to show them in the most positive light possible. Well, I, I, I also grew up, or I shouldn't say grow up, but I, I spent uh, a lot of my uh, very young years in uh, Barrio in uh, in uh, uh, West Sacramento, so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, the culture. How about this uh, running event you got going on? Yes. What about it? <laughs> well, what can you say? Tell us about it or anything? Uh, sure. It's a, uh, it's a trail, uh, run and it's on a private property, um, in Buellton, Los Alamos area. And it's, uh, very small because of COVID. We can't really have a lot of people out there. Yeah. So we have some very intense COVID mitigations in place and most of the people are local and it's a uh, 10 kilometers and 20 kilometers and 30 kilometers so six miles 12 miles and 18 miles it's all on trail it's a loop it's a single direction loop so none of the runners are crossing one another they're all going the same direction and uh that's it you know that's another thing that i do photography is is my main source of business and income, but I'm also very interested and excited in trail running and the coordination of trail running events. So I own five trail running events here on the Central Coast. Hmm. Um, three of them are sort of in suspension because they're on public lands and the Forest Service is not issuing the recreational permits. And three of them are on private properties and those folks are comfortable as long as the numbers are low, and we're very careful with the COVID um, protocols. And if it was illegal, we wouldn't do it um, right now. According to the county health, it is okay to do an outdoor recreational event as long as there's separation. Mm -hmm. We bought a book on tape. Quite a a few years ago, I guess, or a couple of years ago, when we were traveling, we liked to listen to books on tape. And this book was about running. Mm -hmm. And they were, you were in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized uh, about halfway through the book that the photograph on the cover was your photograph. Sure. And uh, so. about your experience in um, Mexico and. Mm -hmm. Really that book is the book is called Born to Run. That's yeah. It, yeah. It's about a trip. Seven American distance runners were invited to go to the Copper Canyons in northern Mexico uh -huh. to run a race with the Targumara Indians, these indigenous people that live there. And so that book is uh that that trip is sort of the background of this book. Yeah. Right. I'm a character in this book. Very little bit, but they, they do say my name in there a couple of times and they do say photographer from Santa Maria. Right. And, uh, that book. Uh, and really your dad. Good. Yeah, my father was there. And uh, yeah, that book changed my life. Um, it opened a lot of doors and opportunities for me uh, for my photo my photography as a runner, my running photography. Mm -hmm. I've so, done and I can do a lot of running stuff. How how, how did the uh, non-indigenous runners do compared to the indigenous runners? Because they're quite they're they're quite runners from everything I understand. Yeah, so the Tarahumara Indians are world renowned for their ability to run extremely long distances with minimal equipment. Um, their shoes are leather sandals with tire treads that they make by hand. They don't have any of the things that we have. Um, they're very primitive, especially when we were there in 2006, they were very primitive. Um, the, the race was 50 miles and there was about 30 people total in the race. Seven of them were the American runners. And yeah, we did okay. I finished fifth overall in that race. 
the wow. book is, the book is sort of based around this showdown between the greatest American <laughs> at the time, this guy named Scott Jurek, and he was there racing against this guy named Ornolfo Quimari, who was the champion of the Copper Canyon. So there's this American champion and this Tarumara champion together racing 50 miles. And um, at the end, the, the Tarumara Indian beat Scott Jerk by seven minutes. <laughs> well, that was quite a big deal just to even have permission to be there, I imagine. It was very special because um, you can't just show up there and run with these folks. So it, there was an American man living there at the time and living among them. And he is the one that coordinated the race and invited us there. And and I took my camera and I, I had the opportunity to photograph these people. If right now, if you just get your phone and go to Google and you just type in the words Tarahumara runner, Lewis Escobar, you put those two words together and you'll see a whole bunch of pictures that I made in 2006. And I'm pretty proud of those because previous to that, um, there was really no imagery of these people running in their own environment. There's pictures of them like performing at train stations or in hotels, dancing, stuff like that. But there was really not a, a, a authentic photographs of them running in the mountains. And then I had the chance to go there and do that. It was a big deal. And it, it's still a big deal for me. They had never seen a digital camera. So I, took a few photos of myself and then showed them the back of the camera and they couldn't believe it. They were just, they were laughing hysterically. <laughs> and then, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And then I, then I like slowly after three days pointed a camera at one of them and fired off a couple of frames. And then I showed it to their, you know, his, the buddy. So there's this Indian sitting next to me and I took a couple of pictures of him. Then I showed it to his friend. And of course I don't speak, they don't speak, they don't even speak Spanish. So I don't speak their language, but I showed the friend the picture and he starts laughing. So the other guy wants, he wants to see his picture. So then I handed him the camera and allowed him to photograph his buddy. And they were just having a great time. They just thought it was, I don't know what they thought. It was like some magical thing. And we had just had a great time. It was, uh, it took three days to, to warm them up or to gain their confidence enough to allow me to take pictures of them. And that's how I did it, by sharing the photos on the back of the camera. That's a neat story. Did, did you take the train in? Is that how you got in? The, I've been there a couple of times. And the first time in 2006, this particular trip, we did not take the train. Um, we, we drove from El Paso, Texas to a place called Creel and then a truck to the bottom of the canyon and then 35 miles on foot to get to the village where these people lived, um, a place called Munarache. The second time I went there, we flew into Mazatlan, Mexico, and then took a bus to a place called Las Mochas and got on the train, which is called El Chepe. And then it was like a 12 hour train ride going back in time. It's like being in the D Disneyland in that train where you're going and then there's dinosaurs. It was like that. We were just going into the, into the canyon. Um, isn't there a place where that train does like a 360 loop or something like that? So, yeah, I, I don't know much about all of that, but that train is world renowned because of the engineering, because mm -hmm. of the, the track and the bridges and the blasting. And it just, it's, it, there should not be a train going there, but it, it does. I don't know about that particular spot, but yeah. Copper Canyon in Northern Mexico is four times bigger than Grand Canyon in Arizona. Yeah. And it's actually a series of canyons as big or bigger than Grand Canyon. It's a place where outlaws go to hide. The main source of income there is lumber and opium poppies and marijuana. There's a lot of drugs. And uh, it's a dangerous place. 
And I wouldn't necessarily recommend going there, not down into the canyon, but, mm-hmm. you know, go go to that area. It's beautiful, but you need to be careful where you are. All that drug lord stuff you see on TV, it's all true, and it, and it happens there. Unfortunately. <laughs> And they use these Indian people to uh, transport things and they, and they use them as farmers. So, you know, I, I've been there and you see fields of poppies and people are out working in the fields, just like you see people working in strawberry fields here. They're just farming. And you ask them, what is that? And they say, it's rubber. I say, okay. <laughs> it's, 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 it's poppies for, for opium. That I I don't know what they make out of it. I don't know like heroin or I don't know what kind of drug they refine. Heroin. Into. Heroin. heroin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Born to Run. Check it out. Yeah. There's an audio book too, and you can listen to it. Yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> we were probably driving through uh, Northern California and some of the areas where you are now while we listened to it. <laughs> Well, that photograph on the cover of the book, it's not a very strong picture. It's a silhouette of a guy standing on a rock with a shirt on his head. And um, I made a lot of pictures on that trip. And then when the book was written, they asked me to submit a gallery of photos, and I did. And then um, I didn't hear back at all. And then... Finally, they got back to me and said, this is the, they sent me a book with a picture on it. This is the one. That's not even close to the best photograph at all. <laughs> and, but I didn't have any say on it, so they, they used that picture. Yeah. And that image, that one goofy photo, I've made more money off of that than any other image that I've ever made in my entire life. When they made the book, it was hardback. And the image was on it and they paid me a substantial amount of money. And uh, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I didn't know anything about selling imagery for hardcover books. A few months Mm -hmm. later, they contacted me and said, hey, we've resold the book in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we purchase the image again? And I said, yeah, what do I have to do? Just sign here. So I sign an email, send it back. They sent me money. Then, <laughs> then they sold it in Japanese. Then they sold it in, mm-hmm. you know, German. They sold it in probably 15 different languages. And every single time I was paid, it was unbelievable. I I've never knew anything about that world of selling imagery like that. <laughs> and then... You know, they had it in Costco. I would go into Costco and there's stacks of this book with this picture on it. Mm-hmm. And I, then after two or three years, it's like, okay, that was a fantastic experience. Then they contact me again and say, hey, we're releasing the book in paperback. Can we <laughs> purchase the image? I'm like, hell yeah. What do I got to do? They just sign. And then the whole process started again. So it was less money. But still, they resold it in multiple languages, and every single time, um, I was paid. So it was a super, super successful photograph, and that's the, that's the one image that changed my life. And that was in 2011. Pretty weird. <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah. yeah. If you if you Google "Born to Run," it'll just that image will probably pop up. Mm-hmm. It's not a great image. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I just Googled Born to Run book and then images, and then there it is. I don't know if you guys. Well, yeah. you, you can't see it, but yeah. Um, <coughs> it's not even a great picture, not even close to a great picture. So what score would you give that photo? Was there ever the lowest possible score? I don't know. A four. <laughs> and the, furthermore, that image, we were on this hike. We had hiked for 12 miles. We're on the top of this mountain, and these two guys are standing on this rock, and I just see a silhouetted situation. So I whip out the camera, and bam, 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 take five or six images, and then just go about the trip. 
And then when I got home two, three weeks later, I'm editing through the stuff. And that series, that four or five images, they're all out of focus. They're all shit. But one was in focus, uh, whatever. And I just threw it in the gallery. And that's the one. And there was way better photos. But who am I? <laughs> well, that, that photo spoke to, spoke to them. And spoke to somebody. Yeah. And uh, apparently it's, it's what they wanted. <laughs> Yeah, it worked out really well. <laughs> That's yeah, I don't know if you can. I don't know. You can't see it. But... Oh yeah, we can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So wow. that's that's the original file, and there's two people. The guy standing, his name is Billy Barnett. The guy sitting is Micah True, who's the the main character of the book. So mm -hmm. when they published the book, they this is they 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 took they took some of the elements out right oh. and, and they took this horizontal image and made it vertical they completely screwed it up but <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you got paid <laughs> yes i did, <laughs> did. <laughs> got paid very well too <laughs> It was a good one. Yeah, well, you deserved it. Yeah. For just uh, <coughs> the whole experience that you had and the the way you went about um, convincing them that the camera was good and they accepted that. I mean, that not everybody could have pulled that off. Yeah. Well, runners, even though we don't speak the same language, we do have – running in common and so even though we've never met they're people from literally another world we had this running the passion for running in common and we were very very interested in them and they were very interested in us and so even though they were very shy and bashful and um, timid they wanted to know more about us they, I think when we met the, those Indians, it, it was like we were looking at people from another planet. And I think they were looking at us like we just dropped out of Mars, too, you know, with our fancy clothes and shoes and all this technology we had with us. Even in 2006, we had nice watches and you know, GPS gear and stuff like that they'd never seen. Did that change the way you run? Did it change the footwear that you use? It changed it, it changed the footwear industry. So if you read that book carefully, mm -hmm. there was a time when there was something that was called the minimalist um sort of revolution in footwear and everything went very, very minimalist. And you might even remember people running around with little weird toe socks, those toe shoes, yeah. like gloves, those are called five fingers. Vibram Five Fingers. And so those things came directly out of this trip to Mexico and it came directly out of that book. It didn't change me personally. I've never really bought into the idea of barefoot running and minimalist running, but it did have a big impact on the outdoor industry and the shoe running shoe industry. Yeah, it's a great book. I, I haven't even really talked about it or thought about it for a long time. So thanks for reminding me. Yeah, well, we enjoyed the book, and it was uh, special to us because we we knew. They know that guy. You, yeah, we know that guy. <laughs> well, you guys, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. I hope that I did an all right job as a judge. It's pretty difficult, and I think every time I come or we talk, I always encourage you. You guys should judge each other sometime. You know, so you can so you can feel what it's like. Because all of the imagery is great. Everything you guys are putting up there is fantastic. You, obviously, you're putting a lot of thought and care and love into all of these images. They're beautiful, and to try to put numbers on them, it's really, I don't know, it's, I don't, know, I don't think it's, a, it's not really right to be putting numbers on your work. Yeah. I, I think what um, we value the most is. Is the comments are the comments that uh, s tell you what you think is effective and what we could do to improve the photos, and yeah. that's more important than the numbers. Um, and, yeah, and so I guess so. I guess just hearing, even if that other person's thoughts 
aren't even up to your standards, at least hearing somebody reacting to your work, I'm sure that has value. Even if you're like, <laughs> listen, even if you're listening to it and saying, this guy's just so full of shit, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Still, you're getting some kind of feedback watching somebody react. To it. So I guess there, I guess there's value in that. Sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you can look at, it's hard to be objective to your own work. And so it's hard to know how other people read your work. And so the more people that can tell you how they read your work, the better a photographer you become, I think. And, and the more you can appreciate other photographers' work, because then you start to look at things differently and, and try to see things in more than one way and what that photographer is trying to express. And, well, every time I get the chance to do this with you guys, I always go away excited and with imagery in my mind and like, oh, I bet it's great the way that they did this or that. And, and I, I want to incorporate that into my stuff. So I love it. It's a, it's a good, it's a symbiotic relationship when I come to these things. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all, and I will I will follow up Cheryl after I speak with the owners of Gladaway and see if they're really serious about doing it, and um, I can I can get back to you with with their thoughts and see if we can make it happen. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. All right, Thank I'm going to leave the meeting now. Thank you. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night. That's all. That's all, folks. See you in December. <laughs> <laughs>